Hey everyone, it's Jake from Algo Daily here, and today we're going to cover a very important topic for technical interviews, which is understanding big O notation and algorithmic complexity. So, algorithmic complexity and big O notation is extremely crucial for technical interviews because it allows you to, to properly evaluate the performance of one algorithm or one procedure or function over another. And for reasons that we're going to uncover, it's not good enough to just say that one program ran in five seconds versus another program ran in 10 seconds. There's another layer that we have to explore, and we'll do that in the following lesson. And so by the end of this lesson, you should be familiar with what algorithmic complexity and big O notation are. You'll have seen their use for technical interview problems, and you'll know how to use these tools to measure how good of an algorithm one is. So developers can write programs in many ways. And what we want to do is ultimately ensure we're running the fastest programs possible in terms of execution speed and in terms of scalability. It's important to understand which algorithm to use and use the right tools to choose the ones that we roll out in production. So let's take some steps back and start with some basics. What is an algorithm? Well, a computer algorithm is a series of steps that the machine takes in order to compute an output. So from an input, it computes an output, and the steps in between, the measure of how much that step, those steps scale, that's what we're going to cover today. And so one of the metrics used to compare algorithms is algorithm, algorithm complexity. So let's take an exercise where we write our own exponent power function in Python. So you can see here we have a custom power function that takes two inputs, an x and a y, and we want to raise the x to the y power. And so we start with 1, and we iterate through the range in y, and at each step, we multiply the result so far by x again. And so we can execute this, and we should get 81. So we know the function works. Now let's go ahead and use the Python interpreter to time it. And we're going to time how long this function runs. And so it ran in roughly 0 0.6 milliseconds. And if you run this a few times, you'll get a speed like this, 600 nanoseconds with some margin for error. So let's remember those two numbers, 600 nanoseconds on average, um, and we just saw 0 0.6 milliseconds. Now, let's say we didn't want to implement our own exponent function or power function, and we wanted to use the built-in one instead. Usually, in most standard libraries, the built-in functions are significantly faster because there's tons of engineers that have worked on the standard library um, for years and years, for however long the programming language has been in, in, in existence. So let's just raise 3 to the 4 using the pow function, and this is built-in. Let's see how fast that runs. So that runs in roughly 0 0.4 seconds. 0 0.4 milliseconds, rather. And if we run this a few times on average, we'll see it takes roughly 308 nanoseconds with some room for error. So what have we just learned? The built-in function took roughly 308 nanoseconds and is roughly half the t it took roughly half the time as the custom function that we wrote. It's a simple example, but what this shows us is that you can have the same inputs return the same outputs and have one function or one algorithm be much slower or much faster than another. And so it's important, it's very important to determine algorithmic complexity and optimize for it. But why do we need big O notation if we can just measure execution speed. So what we've measured so far is something called clock time, which is 
how long our computer took to execute the function. We then used this clock time to compare the two programs when we saw that one ran roughly about twice as fast as the other one. The problem is clock time is hardware dependent. If I were to run that function multiple times, once on my fast computer and another shipped to the cloud on a very slow computer, the speeds may be significantly different because there's so many things that influence hardware. It could be the quality of the hardware. It could be uh, whether it needs to wait for a thread to for a thread to open up. It could be that um, there is network lag. It could be that the there's the the problem is very CPU intensive and the hardware can't handle um, that operation. So an efficient program may take more time to execute on a slower computer than an inefficient program on a fast computer. And thus, clock time isn't really a good metric to find time complexity. So what is? Well, the answer is big O notation. So this is super important. Big O notation is an algorithmic complexity, algorithm complexity metric. So this is crucial. It defines the relationship between the number of inputs and the steps taken by the algorithm to process those inputs. Note that it doesn't measure speed. It's about measuring the amount of work a program has to do as an input scales. And we're gonna go through a few examples to help you uh, understand this concept. So again, it defines the relationship between the number of inputs and the steps taken by the algorithm to process those inputs. It's measuring how well it scales rather than how fast it executes. And so here's some common um, functions and big O notations. Constant time, which means that, like the name might suggest, no matter what the input size is, the operation will take the same speed to execute. And it ranges all the way up to factorial and exponential, which are some of the slower methods or some of the slower notations, uh, which is O of two of two to the n and then O of n factorial. So let's go through another quick exercise to see how this concept plays out in real life. So let's say we write a function called display first cube that takes an items array. What display first cube will do is it'll always grab the first element of the items array and raise that to the third power and then print the result. Now, this will run in constant time complexity. And it's because the steps taken to complete the execution of the program remains the same irrespective of the input size. So no matter what, we're going to take the first element and raise it to the third power. Even if this array were to grow to three times its current size, we're still going to grab the first element, raise it to the third power, and return it. So just, this just reiterates what I just said. The number happens to be the first element, first item of the list that, passed, that was passed to it as a parameter. So no matter how many elements there are in the list, the function always performs exactly two steps. It calculates the cube of the first element, and it prints the result. So what we can do is we can use matplotlib to plot the scaling of constant algorithm complexity. And we'll get something like this. As the number of inputs grows, the number of steps taken remains flat. Now let's see something with linear time complexity. In this, me in this method, display all cubes, we take another input array, but this time we iterate through each element in the input array, and we raise it to the third power. What's important to note here is that this line is extremely crucial. We are iterating through the elements of the array. And as such, we're going to be concerned with the size of the array because we need to perform an operation per element. So in functions or algorithms with linear complexity, 
A single unit increase in the input causes a unit increase in the steps required to complete the program execution. This is because as the input grows, it will need to do one unit more work per item. So let's plot this. As the input grows, the number of steps required grows linearly in lockstep. And that's what that means. Now, quadratic complexity is n squared. So it takes in an input array, and we're going to iterate through every element in the input array. And then at every element, we're going to iterate again through every element. And so if we take this example, if we have an array with four elements, the number of steps taken will be 16. If we were to add a fifth element to this array, to this input array, the number of steps wouldn't be 16 plus 5 to get 21 steps. The number of steps would be 5 squared, which is 25 steps. And so it's actually scaling up faster than one unit per additional input. And so if we plot this, you can see it's no longer linear when you compare inputs to steps. It's actually scaling up and it's increasing faster. So the, number, the greater the number of inputs, the more number of steps you'll need, but at a faster rate. And this is something we want to avoid when we write algorithms, if possible. Now, with space complexity, the idea is pretty much the same. We simply calculate the space working storage or memory that the, algorithm, that the algorithm will need to allocate against the items and the inputs. So here, if we take the first example again, where we just take the first element and raise it to the third power, no matter the size of the input, it only has to allocate memory once just for that result variable. So we can say that, we can say that this function has constant time constant time and constant space complexity. We're not going to need to allocate more space than this one, um, than this one operation and this one result. Similarly, the space complexity of display all cubes will be O of n, will be linear time. So that's the one where we had to iterate through the elements. And so we're going to need to allocate space each time for each element in the array, and as such, space complexity is linear. And now just a final word on best versus worst case complexity. So you might hear the term worst case being thrown around. An algorithm can have two types of complexities. There are best case scenarios and worst case scenarios, and also average, average scenarios too. Um, the best case scenario refers to the complexity of an algorithm in the ideal situation. So let's say we wanted to find an item x in a list of n elements. The best case scenario is that we find the item at the first index. And we, so, so we just have to find, we just iterate once, find it at the first index, and then call it a day. And the worst case is if we were to have to iterate through every element to find it at the very end. And we refer to this as the worst case complexity. And to, uh, to allow ourselves wiggle room in determining, um, uh, in determining algorithm trade-offs, we usually use worst-case complexity to deal with worst-case situations. And so in conclusion, big O notation is one of the most commonly used metrics for measuring algorithm complexity. And hopefully now you're better equipped to make trade-off decisions based on complexity in the future. Thanks for watching.